Welcome again. In this session, we are reading John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. Jesus and the Samaritan woman. This is a very, very interesting story, and it is packed full of rich spirit, spiritual truths, okay? As I would like to say, little gold nuggets of truth. Well, I, you know what? One thing I got I to gotta say is this, is that um, the book of John, I find to be one of the richest books of the Gospels. And I believe that's because John was the closest to Jesus. Of all of the 12 disciples, John was like the favorite. You know, it's called the disciple. You know, he was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, so he was the closest, the closest friend, as, as it were, or the, the closest disciple to the rabbi. So you can see this reflected in his writings. So let's get right into this. This is John chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself didn't baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed into Galilee. Now that's one thing that we don't think too much of, right? I mean, we think about John the Baptist being the baptizer, and we think of, you know, some of the people in the book of Acts that were baptizing, but we don't think too much of the disciples of Jesus during Jesus' ministry being like baptizers. But here, it clearly says that they were. They were the ones that were baptizing people. They were baptizing people. Can you, can you picture this? Like 12 disciples. Well, I mean, we don't know for sure all 12 of, 12 of them were baptizing, although, you know, it very well could have been. But can you picture the disciples of Jesus baptizing people? That's something you don't really see paintings too much of or pictures or people talking about too much. But hey, that's, that's you know, it's good to know as much as you can know about Jesus and his disciples. So let's continue. Verse 4. He needed to pass through Samaria. Now, I want to stop here again and just say this. Samaria was not the most uh, well-reviewed area uh, in, in, in Jesus' day and age. Samaria was populated by the Samaritans, of course, and the Samaritans were known as being, you know, half-breeds of Jews and, and Gentiles. So um, Samaritans were kind of like hybrids. or They were pretty much outcasts during the day. You know, the Jews of that time, they did not associate with Samaritans. Let's go on. Verse 5, So he came to the city of Samaria, called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Yosef. Jacob, or Yaakov, Yaakov's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being tired from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That would be about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. Hmm. So he initiated a conversation here with a woman. Just out of the blue, so to speak, Jesus said, Give me, the, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So Jesus was all alone here. That's another thing. He was all alone. A woman came. The woman was apparently alone. And so Jesus said, give me a drink. You know, and the wo woman might not have been alone. There might have been somebody with the woman um, to, to actually help her with the water. And let's go on. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, you see, here is, it's very typical of Jesus here just to have some kind of a very sharp reply, a sharp answer. You know, because he's the one that initiated the conversation. Give me a drink. And the woman's like, well, wait a second, you're a Jew. <laughs> you know, 
And why are you asking me for a drink? I mean, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. So why do you come down, so to speak, to my level? But Jesus said, oh, wait a second, wait a second here. If you knew who it is who's speaking to you now, you would have asked him first to give you a drink. And he would have given you living water. Okay. So, hey, I mean, Jesus pretty much gave her a, a rebuke right there. Hey, you know what? I, I shouldn't have been the one that spoke up to you. You should have been the one that spoke up to me if you knew who I was. That's gone. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. So where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Yaakov? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his children and his livestock? Jesus answered her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst again. But the water that I will give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Here again, Jesus is very sharp, very definitive in what he's saying in his answers. He's saying, listen, <laughs> again, it's kind of like putting her on the inferior side, okay? The water that you're dealing with is temporary water. You're going to drink this, and it's not really good. It's going to be a temporary satisfaction. The water that I'm going to give you, the water that I can give you, rather, is a water that will satisfy you for good, it does not lack power to, to satisfy in the long run, okay? This water that I'm giving you is a water that will satisfy you for good, okay? You're never going to thirst again after drinking this water. That's how good this water is. Let's go on. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty. Neither come all the way here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you said, well, I have no husband for you have had five husbands and he whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. Now, uh, attention Christian, okay? A lot of people believe that Jesus is just this hyper nice you know, so goody two shoe kind of hyper kind kind of guy that would just give to everybody without asking any questions. They would just give freely, 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 freely. Notice, Jesus set a trap for her, so to speak, okay? Listen, I'm going to bait you with this water that I've got. You need to ask me for this water. You are drinking a water that is an earthly water, so to speak, a water that it only temporarily satisfies you. I can give you a water that will eternally satisfy you. You will be eternally satisfied. And she says, of course, okay, like, okay, give me, the, give me, some, give me some of that water. And Jesus said, go call your husband. Right away. Without missing a beat, Jesus pointed out her sin. Right away, right away. The first thing he said is, wait a second now. <laughs> now that you're interested, you've got some sin in your life. You need to deal with that. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, now why would she say this? Because she knew and he knew, and she knew that she knew that she knew that there's no way that this man could have known what he, what he knew except he were a prophet, okay? So she clearly identifies him as a supernatural being here. You are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So this woman is focusing on a place, a geographical location for God, okay? A geographical location to worship, okay? Now, there are religions in this world that are the same way. They have geographical locations, you know, pilgrimages. 
geographical locations that you go and worship. Okay? Now, there are, this is not to say there are special places that God chooses and there are special places that God does manifest himself. But this woman thinks that there is just like a special place that you're supposed to worship at this place opposed to another place. Okay? So she's focusing in on geographical locations. Let's see what Jesus says to her. Verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship that which you don't know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Powerful point here. Jesus is making the point that salvation is from the Jews. And he's talking to a half-Jew. He's talking to someone who claimed that Jacob was her father. He didn't deny that. He didn't dispute that. But she was not considered to be a full, full, you know, blood Jew, okay? Because she was a mix, okay? But nevertheless, Jesus made the point that they do not know what they worship. The Jews know what they worship according to Jesus for salvation is from the Jews that's what he meant by we worship not which we know yet you worship that which you don't know because we are the Jewish people and salvation is from the Jews in other words consider the source of your faith consider the source of your faith you worship that which you don't know you're not a Jew at least not a full Jew, 100% Jew. You worship that which you don't know, but we worship that which we know because salvation is from us. You get your doctrine, you get your word of God, you get your faith from the Jews. Powerful point that Jesus is making here, okay? Again, he's not this kind of guy that goes, well, all everybody's equal. You know, woman, you're just as equal as I am. I'm just as equal as you. We're both human. You're Jewish. You're at least you're half Jewish, and I'm full Jewish. So I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to come against you regarding your nationality. That's not what Jesus did here. That's not what Jesus said here. I mean, we're studying what the scriptures say. Okay? This is what the scriptures say. This is the Jesus of the, the scriptures. This is the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? He singled out the fact that the Jewish people are the Jew are the people who through whom God has given his word. And if there's anybody that knows God, it should be the Jewish people. It should be the Jewish people. Consider the fact as well that during Jesus' day there were a lot of Jews, Pharisees, Sadducees, all these kind of Jews that didn't really know God. So Jesus is saying, generally speaking, we worship, we Jews worship that which we know. You Gentiles worship, you worship God, but you don't know, you don't really know him. But the hour comes and now is when, tr when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So Jesus is saying here, it's much more important to worship in spirit as opposed to in this, in this place here, in that place over there, in Jerusalem, in yada, yada, yada. It's much more important. It's the, the, the whole idea here is to worship him in spirit. And worship him in truth. In other words, don't be a hypocrite. Don't pretend to be a worshiper of God when you don't live the life. Okay? Why did Jesus bring up that point? You know, worship him in truth. Because look, at she is proclaiming herself to be a religious person. Our father Jacob, worship, and you know, all this kind of stuff she's talking about. But she's not in the right place in her life. She's not in... You know, she's got some stuff to deal with. Put it that way. Verse 25. The woman said to him, 
I know that Messiah, or Mashiach, comes, he who is called Christ. When he has come, he will declare to us all things. Very interesting that she points that she all of a sudden her mind is turned towards the Messiah. Like, wow. Uh, like what she has experienced, what she is experiencing here, this, the prophet, the knowledge, the person that he that's talking to her, what he's saying and how he's saying it. All of a sudden, her mind is diver- diverted to the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who speaks to you. Oh, very clearly here. Very, very clearly. At this, his disciples came. Now, uh, at this point, his disciples came. They marveled that he was speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what are you looking for? Or why do you speak with her? So it shocked his disciples that he was speaking with a woman. Now, note that. Jesus wasn't the type of person. He wasn't the type of guy to even talk to a woman. Okay? At least not in this kind of context. Of course, you know, he would have people all of a sudden fur on the back of their neck start you know start standing up and well he talked to mary he talked to uh martha he talked to his mother didn't he well yeah but not like this not in this context and obviously circumstantial evidence here and the fact that the disciples were surprised that he was speaking with a woman tells you that he didn't speak if he did speak with women it wasn't very much at all and because why would they be surprised if he was the type of guy that a lot of these videos and a lot of these preachers and pastors uh, like to portray Jesus as? Just this guy going around just loving everybody and just speaking to everybody as e- you know equal equally everybody equally? No, that's not the way he did. That's not that's not the way he ministered. He chose. I'm just pointing out the facts here. He chose only men to be his disciples. I mean, if Jesus were like some people today, he would choose, you know, six men, six women to be equal. Equal opportunity employer. That's not what he did. Well, that, you know, some people might say, well, that's just the culture back then. Jesus is above culture, okay? He is the Lord. And when he was on earth, he had the opportunity. He had, he had the opportunity. He had plenty of opportunity to preach the message that a lot of people are preaching today in equality and this kind of stuff. He didn't. Why didn't he? Was he too stupid? Of course not. What did he not know about civil rights? He knew about everything. He knew about everything. He was the Lord. So that's Jesus. That's the Jesus of the Bible. He chose only men to be his disciples and his conversations with women were so few and far between that his disciples were surprised when he spoke to a woman. Verse 28, So the woman left her water pot, went away into the city, and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything that I did. Can this be the Christ? Now, this begs the question, you know, later on in this same book, same author, John, said that that he did not write of all of the things that Jesus said and all of the things that Jesus did, because if he would have, then the world itself wouldn't contain the books, uh, contain the resources to hold all of that information. So, obviously, John made it clear that he only, he was very minimalistic in his Uh, in his uh, biography here, in his reporting of what Jesus said and did. So when the woman said, come and see a man who told me everything I did, begs the question, did Jesus only talk to her about her past husbands or past relationships and her present relationship that she should get resolved, she, she should deal with? Here again, the evidence seems to, seems to support the fact that Jesus probably talked to her about a lot of other things. And, I mean, she said he told her everything that she did. No wonder 
she called him a prophet right off the bat. So something to think about. They went out of the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. You know, again, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. He is a rabbi, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. That is Yeshua. But he said to them, I have food to eat that which you don't know about. The disciples therefore said to one another, has, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Don't say, yet there are four months until the harvest. Behold, I tell you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, that they are white for harvest already. He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit to eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you haven't labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now that just reminds me of another teaching that I did about how people condemn preachers, especially preachers that are on the street. You know, because a lot of these preachers on the street, they seem to have a very harsh message and quite frankly, they need to. You're out on the street, you're out on the front lines. And so people condemn them saying, well, you know, look, at they're not bringing anybody to Jesus. What, what, what they're doing is not really drawing people to Jesus. You know, they're offending people. Well, you know what? Jesus offended a lot of people. And, and so the point is, you know, that uh, some people go up to these, these preachers and say, well, how many said the sinner's prayer today? How many came to the Lord today? Well, most of these street preachers would tell you, well, I can't tell you how many people came to the Lord today. All I know is I'm out here and I'm preaching. You know, and so that's the point. Jesus made it clear here. One sows and another reaps. You can, I mean, you can go in and you can reap the harvest from the work that somebody else sowed in someone's life. Somebody else could have come around and told someone to repent and preach the gospel to them. Uh, and you could come around and they could be ripe for the harvest and they could just fall into your hands and you could just, you know, reap the harvest. And you get the credit for it? No, no, no. I mean, you know, you got to consider how many people have sown into these people's lives before they actually repent and before they actually, you know, establish a relationship with the Lord. One sows, another reaps. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Let's continue. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me everything that I did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with them. He stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, Now we believe, not because of your speaking, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So that woman was used of the Lord, whether or not she actually did repent. That's another, that's another question, you know. Um, she was still used of the Lord to bring many to him. Now, that just wraps it up with another point, okay? You go back to the beginning of this whole reading. You, you notice that Jesus set the stage for her talking about the living water, talking about how... You know, you can ask of me and I will give you the living water and it will, it will eternally satisfy you. You know, and, and, uh, and when she did ask, Jesus immediately pointed to her sin. Now, there's no evidence here that she actually repented of that sin and there is no evidence here that she actually received the living water that Jesus was talking about. So notice, a lot of people just automatically assume, oh yeah, she got the living water. Doesn't say that. It does not say that. I'm not saying she did. I'm not saying she didn't. What I'm saying is it doesn't say. So don't jump to conclusions. So once again, thanks again for listening. I hope this was a blessing to you. May God enrich you greatly as you seek him. Call on his name. Seek his face diligently and you will find him and he will show you great and mighty things. Thanks again. Blessings.